catch all for thinking of like keeping your house from burning down is that a house is like a wooden boat. A wooden boat takes a ton of maintenance and if you don't maintain and paint and scrape and caulk the cracks and everything on your boat, it sinks and the house is the same way if you have gaps and cracks and your eaves are coming apart. Embers get in there and they sink your house. Embers, if you think of it like a sandstorm, you know, embers are everywhere when you have really strong winds and they're looking for opportunities to get into your house. And to look at how to make things safer, but we're also here to talk about how you might radically reimagine what dwelling in these hills should look like. For our fourth day in LA, we'd been hoping that we could truck bikes over to the ridge line at the top of the Palisades Fire. Our plan originally was to ride from there down into the burn and make our way down into the burnt community from above. However, the park was closed and it became clear that we couldn't make legal access. Instead, we made our way to Will Rogers State Park. All right. So the fire, the origin was over here. Yeah. And it, it blasted this way. We're gonna go up on the ridge here. So we can look down onto the neighborhood around Chautauqua where we're going after this. Mm -hmm. But we're just gonna kind of get up on there and try to get the overview. Yeah. Five months, that's crazy. <laughs> the reaction from nature to fire is, is just explosive. Life bomb. On the north facing okay. slope over there, you can see the more senior chaparral skeletons. That will reestablish as big tall brush in about 25, 30 years. This over here might com completely type convert into herbs and grasses. And that's one criticism people have about fuel breaks and, and brush. prescribed fire. And prescribed fire down here. Is, is if we convert these things to grass, it extends the period of time that the landscape is susceptible to fire, and then fire spreads quicker through it. So if your whole point is to protect the community from wildfire, you might actually make wildfires move faster through the landscape by converting it to a grass type seasonal vegetation that browns out quicker. Yep, mm -hmm. earlier too. We work a lot with prescribed fire in Northern California. A lot of the messaging that we put out up there, like it doesn't really apply down here. Like we can talk about good fire and having frequent fires and reducing the fuels and stuff. Um, but like Southern California is a completely different ecosystem. We're here to kind of talk about the subtleties of these different landscapes and how like one thing that works in Northern California isn't gonna work down here. Because you're limited in terms of the mitigation, you can't do really clearing and can't really do prescribed fire, it really places the emphasis on, on the built environment, so home hardening and that larger land use planning around fire because you're limited in what you can do on the landscape itself. Holy crap. Wow. It's interesting, you can see, you know, the topographic influence on the fire severity. On the slopes where there's more kind of appetite for sun, like where the vegetation is competing, it grows taller to chase the sun and it's moister and so you get heavier fuel loading. So you see those black stripes going up there. Those are showing you those areas that have that kind of afternoon shade that are just a little cooler and nicer place to be a plant. When you've got the wind pushing the fire down the hill, <clears throat> these houses that, are, that survived here were in the leeward side of the hill. They're out of that direct southerly flow of the wind. They might've pushed the fire away from them. Or the embers flew over yeah, the top. Over you know? the top. Yeah. So that's why when you talk about like structure survivability, sometimes it's just sheer luck. Uh -huh. And then that's when you have to kind of start to look at the stuff like over here, did they have proper defensible space, vegetation modification? It seems like a lot of these events crescendo, right? And you got like three days of increasing winds and then you get a big blow. And like in paradise, a lot of people, it was fall, a lot of people had already raked all their pine needles and blown all their leaves and cleaned their gutters. And then we had three or four days of really strong east winds before the event and all the pine needles blew down again and all the oak litter kind of piled up in the little eddies behind the houses and all the gutters were full of, of leaves and needles again. And those places where that stuff eddies out of the wind is the same places that the embers eddy out. Talking about firefighting actions during, during the event, you know, it was, it was primarily focused on life safety. So folks were not really engaging in structure protection because there was such a huge life safety and evacuation component. Even the smallest, 
you know, pile of needles that had accumulated could, could transform into a full, you know, structure conflagration because people were focused on life and not property. Mm -hmm. And there were multiple canyons and, and roads here where firefighters made decisions to not go up them, Las Flores and other areas where they just decided that it was too, it was too risky, right? They couldn't get a type three up there and ensure that they could turn around. You know, when we talk about defensible space or fuel modification, we're normally talking about just around the house but it's also kind of important to have some fuel modification along the access route, driveways, even for the property owner's sake. So if they get into a situation where the fire's coming up on them super quick and you have to evacuate, you wanna make sure that your evacuation route is properly put together and fuel mod to where you can get out safely. If a home doesn't require firefighters to camp out there, the firefighters can go do things like put the fire out. It just depends on what your assignment is and how far away the fire is. But like Harrison said, you know, the last couple of fires that we've all been to, like like the campfire and these two fires, life safety trumped everything. So you, there was no fire suppression going on whatsoever, first 36 to 48 hours, none. The firefighters were still doing kind of life safety and evacuation, you know, eight, 10, 12 hours after the initial fire had started. You'd had people that had evacuated. You had kind of the chaos that happened on sunset that resulted in them bulldozing cars so that they could get access. But you still had firefighters like treating civilians and evacuating civilians, you know, 12 hours after the fire because people had elected to observe or to stay, right? And and that's a, that's a complicated thing because they may save their structure, but they may also get injured and they may they or may, die and they may die. People make those decisions and it influences the the firefighting response. Hey, you guys want to look at a map? Sure. We want to understand how the topography affected this initial run. From the point of origin, if you imagine a line that covers this dark purple polygons, if you had a wind vane at the top of this mountain right here, I guarantee you it would be pointed exactly like that during the whole duration of this run. Yeah. It overwhelms whatever the normal up canyon upslope wind right. would be and pushes everything towards the ocean. Right. That's why you yeah. can see those satellite images where the smoke yeah, is like this. It came down the canyon and then it went up onto the, the to benches the bluff. And, and burned, and then it started burning in the ABCs and Rustic Canyon up here. The greens are the 7th, 8th, and 9th, and that the fire had that prevailing offshore, and it was really contained, and then you've got the um, yellow, orange, and red are the 10th and 11th. And, and that's the onshore like, came back. Yeah, the offshore wind stopped, and then once you got the onshores, it made that hard push, and that's when they went and evacuated parts of Brentwood and everything. Like clockwork, and that's just super predictable, right? One of the things about a Santa Ana wind fire is they're very predictable. They're impossible to fight, but they're super predictable. This wind reversal happens 100% of the time on Santa Ana wind fires. You don't know when it's gonna happen, but it's gonna happen. You know, we always say it's really important to close the back door. That's what we're talking about is, is in the early stages of the fire, trying to do this so that when the onshore does come back, but obviously the terrain and and uh, features here didn't allow us to do that. Right, and so, and the ridge where it finally was picked up, like potentially you could fire that ridge and add all this acreage to your fire, but then if you do that and then you get to onshore quicker, you might lose the fire and actually have advanced its spread several miles. And you would then own that because you made that tactical decision to put the fire on the ground. We're gonna go down and check out the neighborhood down ahead of us. I think the theme for like the next transect is like stay out of the way, find a spot that's not right up in the middle of a bunch of excavators. Okay. Oh man, look at that tree. Theodore Cedar probably. That's a sycamore. Oh, it is, it's sprouting. Yeah. Wow. It's about what I expected, you know, like you go and look off the back there. It just drops off steep and it's heavy brush and they're selling this lot for $4 million on Zillow right now. Whoever pays $4 million for this is not gonna build a little humble bungalow right up against the road, right? They're gonna build a big house that takes up the lot. And there's gonna be no way to get your 100 feet of clearance on without it. working on this 
basically this cliff behind here of super inaccessible oaks and brush. You look over the edge, you see it's full of dead material. We're in this like wind tunnel here where the fire blasted down through here because it's aligned with the dominant Santa Ana wind topography. So it's just, we know that we're perpetually gonna have fire in the backyard here and that it's nearly impossible to mitigate that hazard just because of the access. You need to think about that kind of stuff when you build your community in the first place. Create an easement that potentially is also a fuel break where you bring in a chip truck and a chipper and actually do the work. But since this neighborhood wasn't planned with that in mind, the lots are too small. So if you were gonna do it again, maybe you could move the road 50 feet that way and have a green belt or something along the back of each lot that was maintainable as a pre-planned fuel break. Right now, there's an opportunity to do something like that because this entire neighborhood is level. The level of fire hazard in these backyards is as extreme as you'll find anywhere on earth. And we know that. And so there's an opportunity here to reimagine the urban footprint and rebuild in a way that is actually maintainable. The Santa Ana winds are as reliable as the tides. They'll continue to blow down these canyons to the sea until the end of time. These brush-filled arroyos will burn again and again. As we spend billions of dollars to clean up the landscape, why not reimagine the most fire-prone parcels as something that won't burn, like a park, a greenway, a soccer field, a fuel break we can actually manage, a place we can keep vegetation low for many different reasons not least of which is keeping fire out of the rest of the city. There's all these obstacles to reimagining our communities after a fire, but there's billions of dollars being spent right now to reimagine the exact same landscape that was here before. And I think we need to shift our collective imagination to um, direct all this crazy economic activity that's happening right now into new urban footprints. It's deeply unpopular to say this stuff, but I feel like change doesn't happen without imagination and without thinking outside of what we consider to be the, the narrow frame of how things should happen. Ready? All right, let's go. On our final episode, we'll ride up to the origin of the Palisades fire, looking for clues as to how this disaster unfolded. Fire itself is not the enemy. It's the unmanaged fuels, overgrown vegetation, dead brush, and densely packed trees that can turn a spark into a disaster. We've spent a century suppressing fire everywhere. Now we need to work with it. BurnBot is pioneering a smarter approach to fuels treatment, one that is ecological, efficient, and enduring. Combining robotics, automation, and advanced data mapping our skilled technicians seamlessly deploy precision mastication and precision fire solutions, adapting to each landscape through a systematic tech-enabled approach. Our technology is built for the real world, able to operate on steep slopes and tight spaces and across sensitive grounds unfit for human crews. We believe that technology, when applied with intention and combined with boots on the ground expertise, can deliver uncompromising fuel treatment results that minimizes ground disturbance, preserves biodiversity, and adapts to the unique needs of each landscape. In Southern California, our RX machines perform low-intensity prescribed burns with precision, integrating satellite data, weather models, and real-time fuels analytics. They reduce fuel loads while protecting air quality, thanks to controlled ignition systems and smokeless combustion technology that addresses public health and liability concerns. Our remote mastication solutions deliver tailored mechanical treatments, reducing dense fuels without harming surrounding vegetation and structures. Whether you are an agency, a land manager, a property owner, or a community organization, we see ourselves as your force multiplier. BurnBot treatments protect critical infrastructures, safeguard sensitive habitats, enable safer conditions for first responders, and helps communities meet evacuation, defensible space, and insurance requirements. 
Every acre we treat is one more step toward a wildfire resilient future.